Hi guys, this is Luis once more with Emancipated Human. Today we have Danilo Cuellar. He has a show as well called Peaceful Anarchism. He uh, has uh, a lot of interesting perspectives on his show, but today we're going to talk about something that um, sprouted out of a casual conversation. We were talking about uh, family members and um, previous generations and how they went from, you know, kind of disliking the system and turned into kind of a maybe passively supporting socialism. And uh, it, it was an interesting conversation and we decided that we were going to um, try to explore that because I'm sure that a lot of you <coughs> viewers um, will be able to relate to this. And maybe even we can throw some ideas on how to, you know, roll with the punches or just things to say. It's just interesting. It's an interesting thing. So, Danilo, is there anything that you would like to say to introduce yourself? Um, so I have my, um, my show on Voluntary Virtues Network, Peaceful Anarchism. I also have my website, peacefulanarchism.com. I've um, been fascinated with um, anarcho-capitalism for like the past two to three years and um, haven't stopped learning since. Were you a socialist? <clears throat> <laughs> at some no. point no definitely not I think my relationship to government before I really started paying attention to all this stuff was that of indifference I just didn't think about it like I, I had my focus which was chess piano you know theoretical physics science cosmology right massage whatever so government was just completely out of the picture I didn't, didn't, I didn't even think about it um, I just thought it was um a very, uh, I guess, confusing topic, and, when, and and me growing up in my family, you know, especially around family reunions and um, you know, uh, big family gatherings, there was um, a lot of talk about politics and the economy and you know stuff like that, and Democrats, Republicans, and so I just didn't pay attention. Like this is too, how can this relate to my life? <laughs> so, so I just you know would ignore that kind of conversation, but. Um, now things are being put into perspective and um, it's getting a little bit more clear to me. So how did you go from having a peripheral uh, perspective on um, government economics uh, to having it as one of your daily focus uh, <laughs> perspectives I, of life? How did I make that transition? Yeah. Um, I, I think, well, I mean, I started, I think, interested in uh, precious metals and I read the um, G. Edward Griffin book, um, Creature from Jekyll Island. And that got me, you know, really interested. And uh, I read Mike Maloney's book, and you know, just follow different newsletters. But um, when I was young, I was very much interested in Chinese medicine and Chinese um, uh, philosophy, Eastern philosophy. So I studied that a lot, you know. And um, and I think that Eastern philosophy, you know, relating to Taoism, not Confucius. Um, so Taoism which is the, the basis for traditional Chinese medicine, is, I think, probably an almost exact parallel to voluntarism and peaceful parenting and, you know, all these concepts and, you know, Austrian economics. I think, it, I think it's an exact parallel. Like, um, you know, there are certain forces in nature, market forces, that simply cannot be violated, right? And these are not laws that anybody created, right? These are laws that have been discovered, right? Like the law of gravity, law of physics, right? Laws of thermodynamics, right? So these are laws that have been discovered and, you know, you, <laughs> you, you try to jump off a, a, a large ledge, you know, you, you're violating the law of gravity, you're going to feel pain, right? So <laughs> there's natural consequences to breaking these laws. So, so yeah, so Taoism and voluntarism, um, I find a lot of parallels you know, free markets and, uh, and, you know, raising your children peacefully and things like that. Um, and so it resonated with me. So it's a natural, it's a natural progression. That's, that. that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. I have somewhat of a similar, um, background to say it like that. So going to our main subject now, let's just, um, uh, let's just explore. Maybe there's some people that don't quite really, um, you know, I was showing one of my videos to one of my friends and he said, well, this is for people that actually know what the heck you're talking about because I didn't even know that there were many kinds of uh, anarchism. So to, like, you know, dossify the information and, uh, I mean, I'm, 
this does not mean that we're not going to be entertaining for those that are already seasoned in the subject, but just to start from the beginning, mm -hmm. what is socialism? Um, so, well, well, I guess, um, you know, I, I'll say, well, the basic idea of government, maybe we should start with that first. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> right? The basic idea of government, um, a, you know, a predatory monopoly over uh, a violent aggression over a given geographical region, right? Um, which is um, supported by the stolen funds of taxation and the um, myth of authority from the citizenry or the masses. Okay. And and so, the more uh, the more that government expands and assumes control over its citizens' lives, um, society, um, you know, the more centralized authority is the 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 um the less individual liberty and and sovereignty there is right and, um you know the more property rights are destroyed right so so that's basically you know why I see socialism and and communism is just the the slow and inevitable expansion of government and I think it's definitely inevitable once you give a group of people near unlimited power over a large group of people, it's, it's simply inevitable that you will get an abuse of that power and a, a, you know extreme expansion until there's a top-heavy collapse um, due to the inability of the middle class, the productive middle class, to sustain that expansion. Because that's the only way you can expand, right? Is yeah. through the middle class. <laughs> Right, government is uh, not a business. They don't produce any 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 product or service that anybody would would willingly buy, right? Which is the exact reason why they need to use force to institute their, their measures, right? Because yeah. if people would willingly buy it, then it wouldn't be a government anymore; it'd be a business. And not just the middle class, but also you know the upper class that is able to provide a lot of the capital for the expansion. So it's a it's a marriage mm -hmm. of labor and capital. Uh huh. True. Well, I mean, I think it, I mean definitely more in favor of the labor, right? Because you, you know you have all the money, but people aren't doing the work, you know, what's going to happen in society, right? So Exactly. So like, you know, having a Labor Day coming up, you know, I, I yeah. guess like it kind of, it's interesting to me that we celebrate Labor Day, but we don't celebrate Capital Day. So I think, you know, <laughs> that's good. they should go hand in hand. Yeah. Because, you know, you cannot have one without the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just as important. So uh, like, you know, I, if I can, I, my perspective of socialism and communism, sure. mm -hmm. um, I don't think that socialism and communism actually exist mm -hmm. and here's why mm -hmm. i think that it's only a hoax to get people to support the ideology of suppression mm -hmm. by appealing to the emotion of those that they're trying to get the money from mm -hmm. so oh look little jimmy here has no jacket and all of you have jackets so you have to give up your jacket so little jimmy can have his jacket you know <laughs> oh yeah yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. instead of something more productive. So by doing mm -hmm. that gradually, um, you know, like for instance, the communist countries, you know, mm -hmm. China, Cuba, mm -hmm. uh, Venezuela, those mm -hmm. guys ended up being uh, taken over by guys with uniforms and boots, mm -hmm. which, you know, I mean, that's kind of like, um, to me, seems more like fascism. Mm -hmm. Sure, definitely. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. After all, you're, you know, it's basically about taking over something, you know. Just expansion and total, totalitarianism, you know, the, the increase of, uh, of the authority of government over their geographical region, right? Precisely. As opposed to imperialism, which would be the increase in, in uh, authority over foreign regions. <laughs> I'm an anti-imperialist, too. Um, oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. You know, there there can there can be no imperialism without a, uh, you know when there's no government. So exactly. And my and I, I, let me just let, mention this. My wife grew up in a communist country, Romania. Tell me more. So yeah, um, so she she um, she left the country when she was twelve, and in 1989. They, so in 12, uh, which in 1994, right? So in 1989, they had the revolution, which, which uh, all, the only thing she remembers was that they, they, they tore up his page uh, from their textbooks and they, they ripped it up. That's all she remembered, you know, as a child. But um, so she didn't really have um, 
like uh, you know a difficult life. You know, thinking back to communism, you know, I, I guess as children, you know, um, the, it's 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 kind of difficult to um, feel that there was a difference between capitalism or socialism or communism, right? So. For children, it's like you know, children find <laughs> they just play wherever they can. <laughs> they don't feel you know, you know, they're not working, they're not earning, they don't they, they don't feel the taxation or whatever. So, <clears throat> so she said one thing that she noticed, which was interesting, was that first of all, there's no poor, no poor people, right? Everybody had a job, and and I, I guess I assume everybody was making around the same <laughs> the same wage, and and she says the the dental um, uh, business was was horrible. Like it's not a business. The the you know the um, the state dentists were just horrible you know like she would go there and it would be room full of people long lines and you would hear like the, somebody screaming in the in the dentist room <laughs> and then they leave with their holding their mouth and the dentist is like next <laughs> coming up to a city near you <laughs> exactly and, uh, and and she never really had experience with hospital but she said um, her mother did. And uh, <laughs> I think I think her mother had some kind of nervous breakdown, and um, and and she went to go visit her, and and she was like, in uh, it looked like you know those uh, mental health uh, patients in movies, you know, with with the polka dotted thing, and they're, and they're out in the garden just walking around. <laughs> but 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 yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure about that, but but definitely the dentistry she remembers, and and only later actually she did some research and she she discovered how many how many gypsies. And Jews were killed under Ceausescu, which was a dictator at that time. Um, but of course, she, she had no idea about that. You know, um, she just grew up. You know, with uh, it was like a, I guess it was like a racism against the gypsies. You know, it's like call, it's an insult. You know, calling somebody a gypsy is an insult. You know, because gypsies were considered like the outcasts. You know, like the Jews of society, like they uh, wandering had no you know land of their own. You know, selling. You know, they're always dirty selling. Uh, um, their, you know, crafts and, you know, fruit that they would pick on the side of the road, stuff, stuff like that. So, so yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting upbringing and uh, interesting research that she did because, I mean, it's always the same thing. You know, a bunch of people end up dying. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, either shortages or starvations. Or... And actually, I remember reading that, um, that Russia during the, the Cold War um, was... They, they were they were so um, in shortage with food that they had to have they had to receive constant um, imports from the United States just to feed their population because you know through their rigid you know centralized authoritarian structure um, first of all the so the farmers could not grow enough food to sustain their population and second of all there there was no private business right so so the government was deciding what the prices of certain things would be. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I, uh, I remember seeing that they were saying how um, um, like the price of shoes, you know, they had no idea what the price of shoes should be, right? So they charged, you know, too too much and nobody could buy it. People would go barefoot, right? Or they charged, you know, too little and then somebody would go and buy up all of the shoes and then everybody else would go barefoot. <laughs> yeah, but even then, even if they were, uh, you know, pretty cheap, there will be some sort of a cap, you know, you can only buy one oh. pair of shoes per family per month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they always come up with their super yeah. bright ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, how um, cause like we were talking about the, the idea, you know, like our idea that um, when we go to our family members and we, yeah, well, I'm an anarchist. Oh, you hate the poor, right? Or, oh, you hate the disenfranchised or, you, I mean, you know, you're gonna throw you like they imagine you with a bandana and a Molotov cocktail or some kind of crazy shit like that. So, yeah. um, ha tell me a little bit about, about the um, exchanges that you have with some family members. And we we said beforehand that we were not gonna talk about <laughs> names and titles in our families, but because I experienced a little bit of that too. So, tell me what does that look like in your family when you bring about some of these ideas? Um. Well, so I am a, a non-confrontational person by nature. <laughs> so you anarchist. I, as much as much as I am a, a, a contrarian, I try to avoid um, arguments and vicious debates because most of the time they 
some one person ends up getting angry, emotionally hurt, and nobody learns anything, right? <laughs> and then you just enemies, basically. So, um, you know, so when I when I explain to people about um, anarchy, I, I try to uh, I try to take the completely um, you know logic reason. I I isolate myself from all emotion altogether. You know, like I'm not concerned with you know this is how we should treat each other you know with you know fantasy and romance about like you know utopias and you know if only we all shared <laughs> then everything would be fine right so i'm con i'm more concerned with first of all the way things are today you know and human action and what people are incentivized to do in particular situations so you know, this has helped me to break down, um, you know, what government is and how it, how it really interferes with, uh, with the lives of, uh, you know, peaceful people every day. Um, so, so sometimes, you know, some, uh, you know, my family members would bring up that and, you know, I, I, I try to explain things as, uh, as calmly <laughs> as possible, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, Sometimes things get out of hand, but what are you going to do? <laughs> what kind of pushback did they give you? Um, <laughs> okay, well, I got one, which was, um, what about parks? Isn't it wonderful that the government has parks where we can enjoy nature? How could you be against parks? <laughs> Are you against parks, Danilo? No, I'm not against parks, not against nature. <laughs> All I am against is coercion and aggression. Okay. And I think we can have a society absent coercion and aggression. I think that's entirely possible. Well, and I don't think, I don't that's think that we're going to have a society without coercion and aggression. Like well, that well, yeah. is going to happen. But maybe well, good, good. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Maybe like, I should have said that would be a utopia. That. Maybe I rewarded it. I, I attempt to educate people in not supporting an institution that only uses coercion and aggression. Maybe yeah, because I that think way. that in, in a yeah, you're right. There's society, always gonna, exactly, we're going to yeah. be able to handle that better, actually. You're right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I put that wrongly. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Like, like, you know, people who say we, we need government because we have to protect, you know, um, we have to protect us from businesses who pollute and who exploit their workers and who um, you know don't give them bathroom breaks and don't give them vacations <laughs> you know <laughs> who's going to protect who's going to protect the small guy from that you know the greedy capitalist pig right <laughs> right so um, so that's the idea that uh, I think I see a lot of people supporting the institution of government um, however um, I think people don't seem to realize that you know the <laughs> the people that inhabit government are themselves imperfect human beings, right? So if you're saying that there's human beings that are imperfect, you know, how can uh, an institution that is inhabited by imperfect human beings be any better, right? These In are not in charge of everything. These are not angels, you know, these are not demigods, these are people. And and actually they're actually one of the most clever people because if you're if you're a thief or if you're some kind of uh, criminal, I guess, um, and you're a, um, a wise criminal, if that's a possibility, you would rather enter government <laughs> and wield your power um, over, you know, a large group of people rather than, you know, do your petty crime, you know, steal this or, you know, murder that person or whatever, um, because you have, you're operating under the cloak of sovereign immunity or legal plunder, right? Anything that you do is considered for the group of you know for the good of society and and can be legal. Yeah, you, you pass laws to legalize um, your crimes, then they no longer become crimes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, so it's like you know you know if if humans are inherently good, right? They don't need government or laws, right? Humans are inherently bad. No government composed of humans can ever be good. I like that. Right, <laughs> and I think Plato said the same thing that you know the more the more laws you have, the more criminals you have. So, 
Yeah, so that's one of the that's one of the the ways that I approach um, talking about this stuff to people is is I talk about specific laws. Like, do you think drunk driving laws prevent people from driving drunk? <laughs> right? Do you think there's less murder because murder is against the law? Or if or another way you can put it is if making laws really helped, then why do we still have murder if there's murder laws, right? Yeah. We should just make murder legal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then nobody would murder it. Yeah. Gee whiz. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and, and I was actually discussing this recently uh, with somebody talking about legality and morality because many times people conflate the two together, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But, right, the, the error is that... Um, how many um, you know horrible injustices in the past were once legal, right? Chain slavery, you know, the Holocaust, Jim Crow laws, right? The Great Purges, right? So how many people all, died because all these genocides. of uh, socialism and communism? According to my research, about a quarter of a billion, about two hundred and fifty million people. That's a bunch of people. Just just in the twentieth century alone. Now that that's counting China. Russia, Cambodia, what else? Romania, Romania. Germany, probably Italy, right? And okay. Mussolini. Uh, um, Mussolini. Yeah, cool. probably a bunch of things in South America, maybe. <laughs> that, that's that's a lot of people. Yeah, and and, and actually, and I don't think that's a, that's a, as uh, as Ron Paul said, right? It's, he says it's no coincidence that the 20th century um, was the century of of central banking and the century of constant warfare. Yeah, because what really enables warfare is fiat currency, right? Because war is entirely um, non-productive and, <laughs> you know, completely destructive and, you know, an annihilates all um, the benefit that people make and produce, right, in their lives. All, I think all the, it, it even goes yeah. beyond the fiat currency because, you know, if we had fiat currency as this, right, but... Like the idea that these guys are the ones that are behind the government, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's what gives them power. And then, like all these two hundred and fifty million people that died, that was legal. Yeah, that was legal. Just to think, yeah, that those people died legally by the government. That just like, I mean, how can anyone, yeah, in the right mind, <laughs> support such system? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if you, I mean, if you were to consider the uh, that death toll to be a, a virus or some kind of plague, <laughs> people would be um, scrambling, you know, for treatment, <laughs> right? But we don't but, do anything about it because it, it's legal. It not only continues, but it's even more frequent today, right? We have, you know, the the episodes of warfare have been constant, and you know, as opposed to the episodes where there's no warfare, it's like dwindling, dwindling, dwindling you know, it's like. <clears throat> How many decades have we been in the in the Middle East now? Yeah, it's just um, it's like it's like oh you know we're declaring war on on Iraq. Oh my God! Okay, I thought we were already at war on Iraq. Right. <laughs> you know. So. But see, and one of the scariest things to me is like I was talking to one guy at a party, and he said that he belonged to um, um, anti-terrorism um, crusade of sorts. So basically, he was a hired gun. Mm -hmm. Right, and he had his team, and and he, I was like, so where do you go? Do you like go to like Afghanistan or like Middle East? And he says, most of my work I do as counterinsurgency is here in the states. Oh, really? Uh, uh oh, that, that made me freak out. Uh oh, <laughs> like imagine how many stuff happens. Yeah, yeah that yeah, we yeah. don't even see in the news because it's legal, right? Yeah, and and what I uh, what I really love is when I when I talk to ex marines, or actually, I I used to um, have a patient, this sixteen year old kid, in, uh, in when I was treating in acupuncture, and he told me he was gonna he was thinking about going into the marines, and so and then so that really made me want to talk to him more about economics and about government, about you know war, and I think I was able to open his eyes a little bit, and now I I send him my articles and my videos. And he's fascinated with it. Good job. You know, and 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 it's like, um, you know, those are the kind of those are the kind of people that you have to uh, try to reach, right? Because before they get swept up into all of the propaganda and all of the, you know, the mindless uh, 
obedience and you know do your job you know yeah <laughs> so uh, but crazy. but yeah what, when i hear about um you know ex uh soldiers becoming voluntarists that's amazing to me that's like wow <laughs> that is pretty cool that's <laughs> it's like cool. uh it's like you know they say you know cigarette smoking is one of the most addictive things and so people who quit cigarette smoking you know it's like wow you did a great great job so <laughs> that's always <laughs> you know, awesome they were, they were able to kick that mental virus of statism that they've been you know programmed with all you know constantly yeah but that's uh, another thing like for instance the family members that are unable to see this is because of the same propaganda that we have been bombarded with for decades yeah so you know like one of the things i i'm a hustler you know i have my day job but i have other gigs on the side and one of them i was uh, selling food at a festival and you know like I'm here serving breakfast tacos of sorts and my mom, you know, she came out to just hang out with me and she says, you know, it seems like, oh, because there was one guy that was saying, I only have $2 and my mom was like, I'll pay for him. I'll pay for him. I was like, mom, I'm here to do a business. I can sell him something cheaper. Yeah. No, he says he doesn't have any money, you know, like, <laughs> and, but see, that, that happened with like several kids that, well, I mean, there are no kids, but you know, several people. And so, like, okay, the idea that, yeah, sure, we are, uh, we're able to do things out of uh, love or uh, charity or whatever, you know, individually. Yeah. However, like, for the, in the large scheme of things, um, you know, it costed me a bunch of money to buy all that food, transport it to wherever I was, you know, yeah, yeah, renting yeah. a U-Haul and all that stuff yeah. to just give it away. So, like, if I wanted to do that, I mean, I want to, like, maybe save up some money and then I'll say, okay, this is going to be charity money and I'm going to give yeah, it away. Yeah. So, like, oh, my mom's like, oh, you know, you, you're you just mean. I'm like, no, I'm actually trying to <laughs> you're just mean. feed oh, your shit. grandchildren. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, exactly. So, and, and, and certain other things like that, you know, like defending the police and, yeah. uh, you know, police brutality. I can't, I'm, I'm not going to say again who told me, but it's like, yeah, you know, some people do deserve to be kicked in their asses. I'm like, well, there's a difference between arresting someone because they were, you know, thieves or whatever, but from there to like harm them and hurt yeah. them and punch them and even shoot them. I don't think that's proper. Oh, so, man. you know, we have been like, because call it what you will, you know, like news, television, whatever school even um like we have this mentality that yeah we have to support the system because otherwise we would be in danger right like uh you know the schools and i mean we homeschool so yeah. uh, the, the, at first my mom's like you know i don't know you i sent you to the best schools and i was no, like mom this is actually better yeah um well i guess that's my subjective preference as and better as an analyst but the point is, I think it's it seems um, it seems a higher route instead of sending them to the propaganda machine. You know? Of course, of course. I mean, you know, how can how can you possibly expect to uh, have a high quality education when you're um, you know putting massive numbers groups of you know students all the same age right in front of a, a teacher that you know can only teach a strict <laughs> curriculum. And they have to conform to certain standards. They have to, you know, they have to give a test on this. And you know, you know, it doesn't matter if some students are, you know, brighter, some students are slower. They all have to conform to the same level. You know, um, it just it, it doesn't make sense how you you can expect people to really become educated from a a system like that. I don't see that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really like uh, there was one guy, John Green, I think, some socialist what that was saying that he doesn't have kids but he's happy to pay taxes because mm -hmm. he doesn't want a society full of uh, dumb kids and schools <laughs> are not for the individual they're for the group they're for the, they're for society yeah. so like i mean he's right to the point that yes you're not sending your your children to public school because they are going to learn to be smarter or to uh, explore their individual gifts they're being sent there as a form of programming Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then I guess you made a really important point early in the conversation, you know, like separating uh, the emotional aspect of it. And, you know, some people may even see that in a negative way because you're not seeing my feelings and emotions. But that's not the point, is it? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, okay, I mean, this is actually hurting people. 
So mm. we need to actually separate and look at the facts, what's mm. happening. So I guess that's like one of the things we need to really keep our cool, like you said, you know, yeah. like being able to just stand your ground, mm -hmm. not like Zimmerman, but <laughs> stand your ground <laughs> yeah. and just be like, okay, well, um, tell me more. Why do you think this? You know, like asking questions, I think it's yeah. a really important and powerful thing. Like if you have a really, really strong opinion about why the government sucks so much, turn that into a question that ha that will provide an open-ended answer. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you think about this and this and, and whatever? And then you will make them think. Mm -hmm. And then their answers, because, you know, you're actually probing them to think, they will actually come up with good answers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is yeah. that your experience? Yeah. So when I talk to people, I, uh, I guess it's the Socratic way of questioning, which is um, just, yeah, probing them with, you know, introspective questions and um, so like you know I would say um, why isn't taxation theft <laughs> prove to me that taxation is not theft right um, and they say well I, I like paying taxes alright well what about people who don't want to pay taxes what are you gonna do to them <laughs> even if you like paying taxes if you stopped paying taxes they yeah. will take you, you know, exactly, they will take yeah. your house, they will take all your goodies. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's not about liking, it's like, it's like, um, but I let the mugger take my money. Exactly. Well, <laughs> right? You know, I didn't resist, so that's not theft, right? Well, <laughs> well, maybe you didn't feel it's not theft, but, you know, other people may not want their property stolen, so um, if, 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 if just one person... Um, objects then it's not a universal principle right exactly <laughs> <You know? laughs> so and very few things are universal exactly I, mean, yeah. I don't i mean i think like personally i think everything's a preference but the point uh -huh. of the matter is like i think that is not i don't think it's the highest route to go and you know plundering people because i have values you know i think that if you work hard why should i take your money so exactly. i mean i mean it's just ridiculous the whole thing so i mean is that is at least personally, you know, I, I struggle with this, especially, you know, with some people um, at work, some people um, in the house, like with family members. Um, do you, is this something that you deal with on a regular basis? You mean having these discussions? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I never initiate them. Never. Because I know that this is a touchy subject for so many people. And, you know, again, I'm non-confrontational, so if it is, okay, so then you don't want to talk about it, I'm not going to talk about it, right? But people know, my family knows, that I do these videos and I write these articles, so sometimes they have questions, so they, they just, like, shoot a question at me. <laughs> they just, it's like a, you know, it's like a cough, forceful question. Why do you hate the poor? <laughs> Why? Why do you? Yeah, what's wrong with you? Why, Why are you like this? So, um... You know, then again, I try to as calmly as possible. What is this? Do I? <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Going back to the uh, the schooling, um, I I had one person say to me, um, you know, there's a lot of people that can't go to a, can't send their kids to public school. You're lucky. You can send your kids to public school, but you're what? not. Like, like, I'm, like, I guess they're talking about, you know, people living in the slums and the ghettos and things like that, right? Oh. That, they don't send, that they don't send their kids to public school, I guess, you know, really, I guess the, uh, you know, abject poverty type thing. Yeah. So they're like, um, how could you not send your kids there? You're lucky. At least your kids can go to a place to learn, to read, and... Uh, <laughs> which, uh, which actually, one, one thing that that um, argument tells me is that they are assuming that kids learn at school, <laughs> you know, whereas I don't consider that education because when there's force applied, how can you call that education? It's right? more like cramming into your brain these how, how could you call that data? Exactly. It's more accurately called, you know, indoctrination, right? That's, I mean, you know, what, when, what are you going to learn with a bunch of yahoos? I mean, you know, like there's a bunch of monkeys at school and like, you know, there's always a bully and... I mean, like, looking back, yeah. I hated school. Sure, yeah, definitely. And I'm not alone in that. 
So I was, you know, first perpetually bored because I'm a little bit of an introvert. But that's not yeah. the problem. The problem is yeah. that if you're an introvert, those guys that are not or that are yeah. trying to look cool, they're going to not be yeah. nice. Yeah. So, you know, um, I was not dumb. So, you know, like, it will do okay, but I will get in trouble because of certain things. So the point I'm trying to make is we are little sponges when we're tiny and we are able to absorb a lot of the behaviors and knowledge mm. from those around us. Sure, so what sure. the hell are we going to absorb if we are <laughs> surrounded for a good part of the day by all these kids, right? Like I would, you know, I think that's why it's better to like homeschool because you're able to teach virtues to your kids. Mm. You're able mm. to teach them how to read and mm. all the wonderful things that the miraculous cornucopia of government gives to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In your house. Yeah, I'll tell you uh, an interesting story. In in uh, high school, I really started getting into um, you know reading a lot outside of school. You know, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, right? Um, theoretical physics, astronomy, cosmology. Um, I read a lot of that, a lot of books on that. Also, alternative medicine. You know, juicing and different kinds. You know, acupuncture, naturopathy, all, all that stuff. So um, I did a lot of writing too, and. Um, my teachers didn't like my writing. <laughs> so I was in my bioethics class. I took a bioethics class in, in 12th grade. I think, you know, this is a cool class. It sounds like, you know, debate. You know, they're interested in, uh, in uh, hearing different points of view. Okay, I'm going to take this class, right? So I quickly realized that, um, you know, they didn't appreciate my, the teacher did not appreciate my opinion. So I stopped raising my hand. And then on the written, written papers, I was answering them the way I normally write, right? Which is basically the way I write now, very in detail and, you know, I, I write a lot. And she didn't like it. She she consistently gave me like 60s and 70s consistently. And then finally she said, "See me." And I and then and then we talked and then she said, "I don't like you writing like this. <laughs> you make me <laughs> you have my to brain. Change it. You have to change it." So, you know what I started doing? I took this as a um ridiculous challenge to myself. I'm like, all right, I'm going to write so simply like a fifth grader. <laughs> so wow. idiotic. And that's what I did. I wrote the simplest way. And I saved those papers. And it's just funny to look back on it. You can see the, the difference between <laughs> the, you know, my normal way of writing and then the very simplistic, idiotic way. And she gave me 90s and 100s. Nuh -uh. wow. <laughs> yeah, she did. And, uh, and then she probably congratulated you. Oh, you're improving. <laughs> you're, you're a good student. <laughs> but, um, but then at, at the, by the same token, I did have a good teacher, this uh, ecology teacher. And I wrote the way I normally write. And she loved my writing. And she actually called me the warrior of right. Because I called her the warrior of right, R-I-G-H-T. She called me the warrior of right, W-R-I-T-E. Right? Nice. <laughs> so I had a great, great um, relationship with her. It was really, really nice. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's, if you, you know, show any kind of, uh, how do you say, um, difference or, or, or separation from what they're teaching, or you know, you know, difference, or or um, then what they expect you to you know write or say, then you're going to be reprimanded, right? You know, you're going to mm -hmm. be put into place. You know, you're going to get low grades, and you know, you're not going to pass the class. And <laughs> and, and and actually, I was I was just uh, writing about this recently that you know when you when we congratulate because you know how people uh, congratulate kids, you know, when they graduate uh, high school, you know, you say congratulations, you graduated, that's great, and. And it, it's kind of, I think that's kind of strange. It's kind of like uh, congratulating a person for giving their wallet to the mugger or the woman for not resisting her rapist or, or congratulating you know, the American people for signing up for Obamacare. <laughs> it's not really an achievement if you were forced. <laughs> and, yeah, it's just like you know, they dump them to the next grade. Like whenever I moved to the States, I finished 12th grade here in high school. And it was just so interesting, like, to see that, you know, when kids didn't bring their book or their, like, pens or whatever, they would just go to the teacher in the front, oh, I forgot, whatever, like, they would never bring anything. And yeah. it, they will be provided with everything. I'm like, oh, my stars, like, I mean, where is the personal responsibility of bringing <laughs> your own stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, like, it, 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 something similar, you know, like, she had us do some research about the 20th century. And I almost wrote a book with images <laughs> and I went to Kinko's and I got it bound. And it was Ooh. just like, I mean, what I'm used to from yeah, school. Yeah. 
And then she gave me like an 80 or some kind of crap like that. And then two girls just had like a a piece of a uh, um, construction paper with a couple of like splashed <laughs> pictures and like wow. a few smiley faces and they got hundreds. Oh, and shoot. I'm like, so, wow. I mean, it's quite obvious that they are not interested in the quality of work or, you yeah, know, I mean, yeah. it's just like a freaking, uh, it's like freak show. Like we're watching freaking Jerry Springer, you know? Um, so, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, if you're watching this still after 40 minutes, uh, please uh, try to uh, homeschool your children. You don't have to know all of your subjects. You don't have to be an expert. There's a bunch of tools that you can use. One oh, of I, I, get, I get that a lot. You, uh, how could you be so arrogant in your homeschooling? What do you think? You can teach them everything? <laughs> I get that a lot. Yeah, the answer is <laughs> no. So the answer That's is so no. Ridiculous. You know, like we, uh, Ron Paul has a curriculum that is free from like K to third. Yeah. And um, then Khan Academy is the, the one that we mainly use. Okay. Uh, and uh, we, we, my wife, you know, takes them to the museum, the planetarium, the natural science, and like all oh, Perot Museum here in Dallas. We, I mean, we go to a bunch of things to be able to just do hands-on learning. You know, like cool. cooking, cool. sewing, and yeah, yeah. Uh, anything. Like even cleaning my guns. You know, we get together and pull them <laughs> really? apart. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's pretty really cool. So you know, and like one of the pretty awesome things is that with my little nine-year-old, um, I, I uh, when I talk to her, I treat her like um, like an equal. You know, N no, like sure. she's uh, inferior. Like um, yeah, like property, like a donkey that is yep. stupid or whatever. Exactly. Like oh, little So you know, exactly. whenever we, I talk to her, she's like accustomed to these uh, to this level of uh, um, um, logic and analytical thinking that she's able to find uh fallacies in my train of thought and wow. she points it out to me and she's like but you said this and what about <laughs> this and this i'm like this is the best day of my life you know <laughs> cool. i could die in peace now now that i know that she's like so well prepared you know like she's able to see and you know she like she sees people and she hears them talk and she comes to me and tells me about it and like just to see how um the thought process occurs and like you know the peers count like she's nine so fourth grade yeah. um like the peers that public school i mean they're still learning how to read <laughs> oh it's so sad yeah i know the uh the, the amount of um misconceptions about homeschooling abound all the time whenever i mention that word um you know i'm like <clears throat> i'm like what is, what is more important right that you force your child to learn facts and figures that you thought were important decades ago when you were young or that they're given the freedom to learn something that they're actually interested in and that most likely they will it will flourish into a possible business and they'll make money you know what <laughs> what's what and, and then and then they say well they have to know how to read they have to go to school <laughs> and i say well how did you learn how to speak did you where did you go to class to learn how to speak nobody went to that right so by passive diffusion, basically, right, being around people that talk, <clears throat> we learn how to speak, right? And I don't, I don't understand how that um, method of learning is not applicable to other things, right? So if you're interested in, you know, I don't know, being a mechanic, you're going to go around being a mechanics, right? If you're interested in, you know, painting, you'll be around painters, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and even so, that goes for, I mean, not just... Um labor things but also for uh, white collar stuff you know you can do like there's a program called praxis in the internet that, and oh and as you were saying that you know this is your regular iphone and something that my teacher told me once is you will not be carrying around a calculator well i will prove her <laughs> wrong because yeah, you right. know like it's right there in exactly, my pocket exactly, you exactly. know so i mean i mean your <laughs> argument is invalid and this is invalid? Is like 2014 and my you know, my children are young, so imagine when they're our age, what are they going to pull out of their pockets? Exactly. That's uh, unfathomable. So yes. that's, yeah. that's exactly my point, you know. And, you know, so one thing that I tell her is, like, do you really want to go to work Monday through Friday, 9 to 5? You know, <laughs> and, like, having to wake up early every day and go through traffic, I mean, I yeah. do that, and I'm doing other things, and hopefully, you know, soon enough I won't have to do that kind of stuff anymore. But yeah. like even like the the bigger corporations, the evil evil corporations are starting to learn that like you know there was a study, and people in a in an eight hour 
workday, they accomplish about three to four hours of actual work. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. I mean, your freaking 40-hour week is like half as productive. So, what if we, I mean, you can do awesome work in mm -hmm. three days, mm -hmm. you know, and like still be just as productive, make just as much money, but we don't mm -hmm. need all these structures and cages, you know. So, basically, like what the volunteerists and the homeschoolers were trying to attempt is like to break the mold and like be able to have like a free society where you know we can be like entrepreneurs and be mm -hmm. uh, do our own thing you know and, and the other thing is public school is only about like um, about 150 years old right and so for most of the human civilization <laughs> people homeschool right yeah does that mean does that mean that there was a plague of stupidity for most of human civilization you know does that mean all the uh you know, the, the philosophers of antiquity are, uh, you know, null and void because they didn't go to public school, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> you, know? you know, like, I, th I think I was reading that it was because of the Industrial Revolution. They wanted workers that will, you know, watch the clock and be there and produce this much. Like, it was, you know, like, we were just extensions of the machine, if you will. And there was a time and a place for that. But we moved on. We moved out of that. We automated a bunch of stuff. Evil capitalism has been helping us to, you know not do the labor with our hands as much so we use like i i get to work on something like this yeah, right yeah. so now imagine like i mean we're still using paper and like things that like you know silly things that we've used from like the 19 uh, what 90s mm -hmm. so and we have technology to even not do that you know so uh it's just uh, uh i think that the way i see it is because of the way we live we're able to introduce ideas to other people. So in other words, we're teaching by example what's possible. Because I think that a lot of people don't do it just because they think that it, it's either not possible or they don't even know that it exists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the stuff that we do is like, um, whenever like we entertain people and they come over, they're like, you know, they're surprised to see that things are actually working because it's out of the... Uh, orthodox yeah. ideology of society. How do your kids know how to read? They're not going to school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tell that to my wife all the time. Marcus can read? He didn't. He never went to preschool or kinder. How is that possible? <laughs> it's so ridiculous, you know. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, and, and actually, I was reading in, uh, um, you know, talking about the forty-hour work week. Right? I was reading in uh, economics in one lesson where he was talking about labor unions and how they, um, you know, just like anything that government enters, it's like a freeze in time, right? No improvements occur. So, so labor unions are kind of foundation on the premise uh, from the technocrats or the Luddites, which consider technology to be evil and a destroyer of jobs. And so they try to artificially create jobs. <laughs> so, so like, they would impose really idiotic regulations like, you know, um, I don't know, this wire has to be cut like this by this person specifically at this time of the day, <laughs> you know, or you know, idiotic stuff like that just to make artificially more work, right? That's government so, for you. Exactly, exactly. So and, anything else that you would like to throw in before we call it a day? Um, any other ideas or any other uh, comments just to, I well, guess, close I did, the shop? I just... Um, my basic um, idea when I talk to people about um, you know government in general and volunteerism is is that there's you, you, I, I like to simplify things between force and voluntary right force and voluntary and and it's a basic you know it's a very basic uh, uh, simplification but I think that um, it needs to be thought about because if people don't think about where the the things that they get that they consider to be free, where do they come from? <laughs> then we're gonna we're gonna live in a very twisted, convoluted, you know, fantasy where you know up is down, down is up, left is right, right? And people are gonna be just confused and like government is confused. Like, you know, how can how can we be in seventeen trillion dollars debt, you know, when we're going to war? How can we have enough money to give foreign aid to all these uh dictatorships overseas but we don't but you know we have starving people here <laughs> right yeah all these contradictions um are the branches 
out of the root problem, which would be statism or the application of uh, force, initiated force, violent aggression. So. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danilo, from uh, Peaceful Anarchism. And whenever we post this, if you want to put your link at, uh, on the comments so people can go check your page out and your blog because you do write a lot. And I think that a lot of people will be able to get a lot of insights from your writing. So we'll do, definitely. Thank you so much for this. Thank you very much. And we, I guess, need to do some follow-up on this because um, I think there's just so much uh, that we can talk about. Sure, definitely. I'm open, always open for conversation. Thank if it's you. not, if it's not emotional, <laughs> as we, long as it's not. <laughs> we can manage that. Exactly. Thank you so much, and this is once again, Luis, with Emancipated Human: Peace, Love, and Anarchy.